bye week is here. Got any fun plans for it? We're here. No, um, literally just staying here, getting the body right, uh, being with the family. Obviously, a little, little weather adversity coming our way, so making sure the dogs are safe, family's good, so we're just sticking around. So as you guys can see by now, my guest today is Dolphins Fullback here on Dolphins HQ from the Baptist Health Studios, and I'm glad to hear you're staying around because I wanted to ask you a question about the value of the bye week for a team who has, you mentioned adversity, I mean, it feels like a year's worth of adversity these first few weeks of the season, just kind of how this league goes sometimes. Um, what do you think the value is of a bye week for a team that is in the Dolphins' position right now? New, newish quarterback, kind of found your footing on Sunday. What's the value of the bye week right now? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different points of the bye week, and when you start the season, you're like, oh, this is a really good bye week timer. Uh, you wish it was later in the season. Everyone's, like, schedule peaking. Uh, I don't really think you can tell what's a good or bad bye week until you're kind of in the middle of it. Uh, obviously, we need to get healthy. We need to reframe, readjust, focus on our fundamentals technique. So we got some extra work this week, which has been good, uh, much necessary for our team just to continue to improve and get better. So I think the real benefit of the bye week you're going to see on the back end uh, with the residuals of all the work and intentionality that you approach that bye week with um, because it really doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the season, early or late. Um, you have to have the right guys in the room to make it worth it and make it right. So, And from that standpoint, I mean, we saw Tyler Huntley get his first win for his hometown Dolphins. Really cool to see that. Do you, you know, as the bye week, it kind of, to your point, it differentiates when it's valuable. Like, it, you don't know until it gets here, right? Do you kind of feel like this is a good time for it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, my body, I'm, I'm excited for it. Oh, um, sure. I know that a lot of guys just need that mental reset. You go through training camp and the start of the season isn't where we want it. Um, but you finish on a little bit of a high note. Obviously, there's a lot of things we want to still improve on. So there's a lot of like really good mindset going on of like, okay, we won, but it's still not that finished project. We're still chasing something and we can use this bye week. It's going to be purposeful, a reset, re-energize for this 12-week stretch that we have down the end of the season. So yeah, I think a lot of guys are going to be able to find value in this one. Yeah, sounds great. Before we go forward, I want to kind of go back a little bit to the game on Sunday because I personally loved seven consecutive running plays to close off a game-winning drive. I, I can't imagine many teams have done that. I mean, it's usually you have to get there through the air a little bit. I'm, I'm wondering if you can take us in before that first of the seven plays. Like, you guys are right around midfield. I think you had just gotten a defensive pass interference to move the chains and, and get you back on schedule. Can you take us in from whether it's the captain's perspective, whether it's, you know, Tyler, the quarterback, communicating to you, what's the mood and the conversation like in that huddle before that run of runs? get you guys into the end zone yeah I think you know I can bring it all the way back to getting the ball in the 20 yard line we had uh Braxton Berrios had a great bluff on a punt return instead of the ball being on the five to start the drive we're on the 20 and you kind of felt like we had a lot of momentum this entire game we're moving the ball but we haven't finished in the end zone yet and uh Snoop comes in the huddle and he's like immediately guys we need to get in the end zone like this is a non-negotiable we can't keep kicking these field goals we need to finish in the paint so from that 20 yard line, you go through it, you have some ups and downs, all of a sudden you get into that third and long. Um, we're putting together a drive, Raheem gets that pass interference call, and you just feel that opportunity. Like we need to take advantage of this right now. We got a gift, obviously it was a penalty, but hey, we're at midfield, we need to finish this thing. And for seven straight runs to kind of tone set, you have Jalen Wright, Raheem going back and forth, um, being able to overcome a couple of those penalties, seeing those long runs, seeing the, outside zone, inside zone, uh, the, the diversification of the run game really showing those seven plays uh, was a lot of fun. It was definitely a statement that our team needed to make, 17-play drive in a very critical part of the game. Uh, I think it was really cool to see the offense when the rubber met the road uh, to be able to take advantage. So you kind of led me into my next question that I was so excited to ask you about. And I wrote down these notes about like, I kind of just threw out some numbers because you played, I think your highest, was that your highest snap total in your career? It's all like it. Yeah, <laughs> it feels like Okay, yeah. so from, first before that, you handed the ball to the referee. I think the last time, one of the last times you scored, you spiked that ball like eight feet below the surface in Detroit, right? Like you slammed that thing into the end zone. We were t we were joking about Seth and OJ, you, you know them from the post game show. Um, we were joking like I don't think he has any energy left to spike that football. Is no. that the case? Yeah, I think the last three or four plays that drive, like my body just took over, and it was you listen to the call and you just go execute. So I like scored, it didn't really even click. And I'm like, where's the oxygen take? Where's the sideline? We're going for two. Am I in? Am I not in? Like there was so much going on that I was like, I, the last thing I was worried about was the celebration. Just get back to the sideline and get, get root the defense on. So sometimes on the show, we make fun of my like peewee football playing days. Yeah. And I was telling the guys like, 
my first touchdown I scored, we, we like didn't throw the ball down the field. You're, you're young. And so I was, I was a flanker yep. and they would throw, there was a screen in the playbook for me and they would call around the goal line. And I was like, this is my chance to score my first ever touchdown. And I know it's not the same thing, but I am curious if there's a parallel to that when you get that fullback dive call at the two yard line. Are you like as giddy as 12 year old Travis was? I, I would say so. And it's like, listen, these opportunities are very few, very far in between. You got to be able to capitalize on it when it happens. So I, I was glad that there's a little crease there to hit. And yeah, I, I felt like 12 year old Travis just running <laughs> around after uh, <laughs> celebrating and scoring. I'm glad that you did. Well, I was probably the shortest track you took the entire day because one of the things I wanted to ask you about was again, you know, 42 two snaps in the game. I felt like you operated 15 different motions. You had like 10 different run schemes to your point. I mean, you, you talked about inside outside zone. Like I saw duo, I saw like pin pull, like there was everything in the run game. Um, you know, played multiple different positions. When you get your, your, I don't know if it's a binder or what the game plan, when they give it to you, like Alec, this is your plan for the week. When you see all that, like how do you process that? How do you prepare for a week where you know you're going to be doing so many different things? So couple years ago I was getting those game plans and I was extremely overwhelmed I was stressed out I'm looking at this entire call sheet trying to memorize both directions every single play making sure I knew my assignment and now uh year three in the system it's like all right here we go could be a big time game could not be depending on the flow of it uh but you're absolutely prepared for it so uh it takes some time to get there but uh, I think there's there's a lot of confidence in our running back room right now and go through the play sheet and it really doesn't matter across this entire offense. Like, is it throw the ball 50 times? Is it run the ball 50, 50 times? It doesn't really matter. Um, just being prepared for your number to be called and executing, uh, that's what – that's what makes those celebrations so special. Yeah, it's, it is cool to see, man. And I get the sense that maybe some of your presence in that huddle can kind of produce a calming effect for the rest of the guys because your experience. And, of course, Raheem's been here that time as well, and Devon's in year two, and Jalen, the rookie, looks pretty damn good in that game as well. I'm curious because do you think that time in the offense has helped you kind of be able to adjust on the fly? Because we were going to show some plays here and break it down, but it didn't happen for us. There was a, a play where, like, I think you – it was Jalen's run off the left right after the pass interference call, and you, like, sprung him for a pretty big run up the left sideline and you like kind of chipped it was either the tight end or the tackles man was that something that you know you're going to do in the play or is that like a, a on the on the fly adjust type of movement yeah so um with those techniques and like you said when you have more experience in the system um being able to feel how a defense plays can completely change my entry point can completely change my technique and for a running back a fullback tight end tackle to all get these reps and to see the multiplications of the defense and be able to all see the same thing without hesitation, hit it in the same spot. I think that's what was so cool about that play because my entry point could be four different places depending on the defense. The technique of the tight end and the tackle could be seven different things depending on the adjustments pre-snap to post-snap. And for Jalen to be running fast, never breaking stride, to see it and hit it, I think those are the, the little glimpses of the potential of the offense that we're really chasing to try and replicate to to be able to do it down after down yeah it's so funny to watch it on tape because i can i can hold the down button and just fast forward in slow motion and see all these things and it's like these guys are doing this at full speed it's got to be so difficult to see it on the fly like that and you allude to kind of finding something on that drive and within that game and that's where i want to go next because you know if, if you go on social media it's like run the ball run the ball everyone wants to run the ball right and the dolphins did it on that drive and they won the game running the football i'm curious do you think whether in that drive or throughout the course of the game do you feel like you kind of I don't want to say found something, but do you think there was maybe a little bit of a, oh, this is working really well. We can have more success doing this going forward. Yeah, I think that you, you look at that drive. You have a 17-play drive that's going to give any offense confidence, right? And to be able to have the work that we put in this entire offseason to show up in glimpses, I think it validates the process we're on. It validates the work that we're trying to chase and we're developing and growing into as an offense. So it's motivating in the fact of, okay, we're on the right track, but it's also motivating on the other side, like we need to do this more often. And uh, I think, you know, I go back a couple weeks ago, I th I, we, you get talked about uh, short yardage worries, right? In the preseason, everyone wanted to figure out this, the short yardage uh, issues. And it's like, man, we just have to execute. And like, you look at the guys in the room and we have that potential and we've done it on tape now. You string long drives like that together, that gives confidence in the room, like this is what it needs to look like. And then there's a standard to that, there's accountability to that. And I feel like that's what the entire locker room's kind of built around. So anytime you're able to put that on film, put it on tape, it's like, okay, this is possible, we've done it, now we need to do it again and we need to improve on it. So I think that's where it gives a lot of confidence and 
um, being able to run or pass the ball. You truly are as good as your last rep, right? Because last year that was an issue, you know, a quote unquote issue. Game one, you executed, I think, two of them, right? Two fullback dies for right. first down. So then it's like, okay, it's solved, but then you don't get them a couple times, and, and now it's like they can't do it again. Yep, 100%. Oh, it's, yeah, and what have you done for me lately? Yeah. But that's performance-based industry, and that's what we're trying to improve on for sure. We love to hear that. It's good to see, it's good to see it be successful in the game. And, um, you know, kind of going back to that moment in the huddle and, and whatever you said to the guys and Tyler said to the guys, I'm curious because you take this captain role very seriously. I, I know you, you do. Um, how, does, how does the role of the captain change or maybe – evolve when things are going well versus when you're on a losing streak? I think the leadership styles are always going to change. Um, and that's just being a human being. That's just being a real person with emotions and a standard and goals uh, that we're all trying to chase. So I think the vulnerability in leadership is truly speaking your mind and building trust with the guys based on the work that you provide, the accountability that you are going to be consistent in what you do leading by example. I feel like that's where if things are going great, yeah, everyone can lead. But when things are going tough, how vocal are you going to be? How consistent are you going to be? Are you going to lead by example? Are you going to kind of go into that shell? So I think there's a lot of challenges in leadership and, and being a captain, but consistently showing up, trusting your process, trusting yourself, trusting your teammates, that's what's getting tested. And if you can continue to, um, man, just, just have faith and believe in the process and the system in place, that's where things smooth out. And over time, you're kind of see these jagged starts the season, but we're still trending in the right direction. I think earlier you had mentioned talk, talking about having the right guys, right, for the bye week to be impactful. Uh, I know this team, I, I mentioned it in this offseason, like I, I feel like the Dolphins are going to have to make some tough choices on who they have for captains because they have so many of those guys that kind of personify what it is to be a, a leader and a captain. What are those conversations like with the rest of the captains, whether it's after a win or loss, how has that process been so far in 2024? I think it's been dynamic, and, and you're seeing guys find their vo voices in a number of different ways. And it doesn't necessarily have to come after success on the football field, on you know game tape. It's being able to trust that you see something or feel something and it needs to be said and addressed and having a group of guys that are listening and like having those hard conversations that uh, in previous years, in previous organizations, in previous situations, right? A lot of guys, human nature, it's to just, ah, oh, man, I don't need to address this. I need to wait until until this moment, and then I can speak up on it. I think we're getting uh, to a place where there's a lot of continuity amongst those leaders and the, and the captains to be able to say, no, we need to fix things now before it becomes a bigger issue, um, before you know things get out of hand. So those tough conversations with the captains, leadership, uh, council, I think that's been a big, strong uh, stronghold of our team that, that can really help right this ship and make sure that we're all aligned in the locker room moving forward. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I kind of want to dig in further that further into that because I, I kind of am fascinated by this conversation because, again, and this is like fan speak, right? If, if something goes wrong, the general notion is like replace people, make changes, wholesale changes. But that's just not how this league works or how really anything in life works. And I always make this point on my podcast, like they can just come in and improve and execute better to your point about the short yardage. So I'm curious what that looks like when you are struggling, when things aren't going your way and you have to come together as a team and try to find what those answers and solutions are because to your point it's a long season man we've seen teams start off one and three or oh and four and make the playoffs or vice versa so it's a long season it's like how do you approach that from the standpoint of like it's it's tough right now but we have it in us and we just have to put the work in yeah um it, it's always funny because there's a lot of opinions on what the problems are or what they should be or how to fix them and when you get into these discussions and you're trying to problem solve and you got a lot of people that care uh at the end of it it's like does it really matter what the problem is? Like if you have enough people on the team that are saying, okay, I have my 111th on this team and I need to get a little bit better in this area and I'm gonna fix this. And you get a collection of 53 guys that are doing that. It doesn't really matter what the problem is. You have a collection of individuals that are solving problems together, right? And I feel like that's the approach of, man, you can, you can have a, a clicker and go in, in slow motion, fast forward. You can do whatever you want to try and figure out what a problem should be and then figure out a solution. But at the end of the day, it's showing up and doing the work. At the end of the day, it's having the right people to problem solve together, to figure out how are we going to make it through and not splinter and, and come closer together through adversity. Um, because I don't really think it matters what the problem is. You look back the past few years, you know, last year I remember the Chiefs dropping the ball all the time, right? And it was like in the beginning of the year, that was their struggle. And they fixed it and they figured it out. That was their issue. They solved it. They stayed together and they made on they went on a run. And I, I think we have issues that we're dealing with right now and every team is 
the teams that can solve those problems together, stay tighter together through those tough times, hit, hit stride uh, November, December, January, those are the ones playing in February, and that's our goal. So I don't think anyone has to shy away from that. I think it's how are we going to problem solve and move forward together so we have ourselves a chance to be playing our best football in December and January. Well, it sounds like we have the right leadership and have the right guy on the show here to talk about it here. And I want to pivot to something else I think makes you the right guy to have on the show for us right now, because I've been kind of doing this on the show and the podcast a little bit here talking about um, the, the league almost pivoting to more of a, a ground game. And again, a seven, you know, seven consecutive runs for a touchdown to win a game. It just does not happen anymore, but we're seeing more and more of it across the league. And, you know, it's the too high shell, all the stuff that, you know, defenses are going to take away the deep ball, but the run game is back, man. Like teams are running the football really well. What's your take on all that? It, it's a, the league is very cyclical and, and you talk about problem solving or figuring out what, um, problems a defense or an offense presents, um, for the past handful of years, it's been how much speed can we get on the field? How many, how many guys can we spread out? Defense reacts by saying, okay, we're going to have nickel and dime, and that's how we're going to practice. We're going to practice running sideline to sideline. And then all of a sudden, it's like you start to realize, man, the personnel might not be the same as it was five years ago. Maybe we can run the ball. So I think it's this big cyclical operation where the run is trendy and it's up and then all of a sudden it's the passing game and uh, I think it's very funny how the league works like that how life works like that so uh, just being able to do either when the game is whatever it is we're throwing the ball a bunch we're running the ball a bunch to be able to execute no matter what that game has to offer I think those are the teams that are going to be most successful we've seen championship teams that have had you know 40 to 44 wins and nine to three wins like it just happens throughout the course of the year um as we continue this conversation I'm, I'm curious uh what was your freshman year at Wisconsin was 2016 2015 2015 yes how do you think the fullback position from that time to now has changed it's a tough question, I think, but that I think is a tough to question. It. I mean, in college, I can tell you exactly what it was. At Wisconsin, there was a fullback position. It was Derek Watt and myself. And now uh, we look at the Badgers right now, Big Ten football, they retire the fullback position, right? So uh, it hurts my heart a little bit. They're doing a great job right now. It's the, the I think it's the dairy raid, they're calling it. And um, they're putting up big numbers. They beat up my guy, uh, Raheem Mostert's Purdue Boilermakers they pretty sure bad did. last week. So <laughs> um, the fullback position there, a little bit out of style, but here, I think Kyle Juszczyk's done a great job. We had James Devlin, those types of guys in the AFC East, um, big neck rolls, and now we're kind of seeing that versatility style of it. C.J. Ham and Pat Ricard being over 300 pounds, being able to get out in space and do what he does for Derrick Henry. So there's always some guys. It's always working it through. That's how the Jets put Solomon Thomas into their formation as well, the big defensive tackle in the football as well. Let's go ahead and close with this, the Ingold Family Foundation. Um, it's well documented. You've done so much good work with that. Just off the top, why is that such an important part of your life and really your entire character? I think this platform, um, Opportunity of Lifetime is only there for the lifetime of the opportunity. And um, being here with the Dolphins in such a great organization, I know it's not forever. Uh, so while I'm here, while I'm doing the very best I can as a fullback of this team, I want to be able to be a voice for those kids in foster care that have been adopted, uh, just to advocate for them, uh, to be able to create really cool experiences with them, with this organization uh, and the Ingold Family Foundation, to be able to partner and do really special things for those kids to uh, make them feel seen, heard, believed in, uh, all the things that I felt like I was able to to have with my forever family, my adoptive family. Yeah, it's a very special thing you're doing, man. And just real quick before we get out of here, can you tell the folks about the, what do you call it, promotion? You're, you're doing something where, yeah. yeah, go ahead and take us home on that. Yeah, so we got a Gifts and Gold uh, fundraiser campaign. So I'm, di I'm dipping in the pockets a little bit now. Every 30 yards that the offense puts up, I'm donating $100 to this uh, playground campaign over at SOS Children's Village. It's in Coconut Creek. They're going to build out this really, really cool playground for these kids. It's going to be happening kind of during that end of the year. Um, they had to tear down the, the last uh, playground, and we're going to build one together this year. So we're fundraising all the 30 yards every single week. I'll put out something um, to be able to say, you know what, this is how much money I donated. Anybody can hop in, donate 30 bucks themselves, get some Lululemon swag, be able to rep out the, the foundation a little bit and help some kids be able to have some some very fun memories on a playground up in Coconut Creek. Now I want to see the 30-yard wheel route to Alec Ingold on next Sunday. 100 yards straight to the campaign. Are Perfect. you kidding me? Times three. Alec Ingold, Dolphins fullback. You're the best, man. Appreciate you. Thank you.